archaeologist. Um, I originally come from Somalia. In the civil war in 1991, my family fled, and we ended up in Sweden, of all places. And there, um, something happened that was, at the time, uh, seemed insignificant. And um, I was in secondary school, studying uh, many topics, uh, and haven't actually um, done my primary school in Mogadishu, in an orphanage college, which absolutely had no comparison with the resources we had in Sweden. It was the other end of the scale. Um, there was this thing where we had a big, huge history book. And I wanted to know about African history. And this was a world history book. But there was only one page on Africa. And there was actually just a one paragraph. And this paragraph mentioned the transatlantic slave trade. And that's important, but surely there was more to African history than the transatlantic slave trade. So I went to my local library, and I found a book by Basil Davidson, Africa, the story of a continent. And in this, I learned about the Ashanti, the Nuuk sculptures, Benin, Igbo Uku, Jenna Juno, Timbaktu, uh, Aksum, Great Zimbabwe, Ancient Egypt. I could go on and on and on. Um, but there was one sentence in that book that came to change my life. It said, in order to write African history, we need to do archaeological research. At the time, having just come from Somalia, uh, I didn't know what archaeology was. But I made a mental note of the word. And six years later, I enrolled for an archaeological course on a WIMP. And I'm probably one of the few people who didn't know who Indiana Jones was <laughs> when I enrolled for this course. And um, I wanted to focus on Africa, so I came to London at the School of Oriental and African Studies um, and UCL. And another seemingly insignificant thing happened. Uh, my mother called me up and said I had inherited an object. And it was this one. I used to see this object with my grandmother all her life. And uh, my mother said to me, it's yours now. And I said, what is it? Uh, I knew what the name of it. It's called Wagger. And I said, what is it? And she said, it protects the keeper from evil spirits. And I thought, oh, good. Um, um, and then she said, well, um, it's actually made from a sacred tree. And it's used for fertility rituals. Um, now, that I didn't know anything about. My culture was Islamic, and that's it. I didn't know anything about our traditional culture, uh, where we had sacred trees and fertility rituals. So I started um, thinking about uh, doing a, an essay on this. I interviewed people. And I found out that there were actually sites in Somalia and Somaliland associated with fertility. Um, so I started thinking about going back uh, to Somalia. That's me doing archaeology in Scandinavia. Um, I was actually one, I was so excited about archaeology. I was the person who was talking to schools about the Vikings and these blonde, blue eyed children looking at me thinking, <laughs> African telling us about the Viking age. Um, so, um, this is the worker. Uh, I'm glad you all can see it now. Uh, and, uh, the idea came up that I wanted to investigate more about this, and there were sites associated with fertility. So I went to, so I decided to go back. But this decision was a hard decision because uh, I left as an IDP and a refugee, and these landscapes were places I've associated with 
unpleasant experiences. So it wasn't a, an easy decision, but I decided to go back. And when I went back, I discovered that actually this region was a cultural crossroad in prehistory. It's strategically located on the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean, and a lot of civilizations has passed through. And not only did they pass through, but they interacted with the locals, and there was trade coming in uh, from Persia, ancient Egypt, India, China, and many other civilizations, and hinterland Africa. And the archaeological materials that we've discovered basically is evidence of this. Uh, we saw earlier um, a video showing uh, scripts, ancient scripts, and one of the findings we made are uh, gravestones uh, showing Sabaean writing and Himyarite writing. And the Afro-Asiatic family, uh, language family, uh, has its birthplace here. And we see there is so much history that uh, was completely, totally unknown to me and to many people. But I wanted to focus on um, and follow the Wagar that I've inherited from my grandmother and the fertility rituals that I've heard so much about. It led me to a site called Oberhalle. This is, uh, in the oral history, uh, a site where we, it's been a pilgrimage site for a very long time. And uh, when you go there, it's seemingly, it's just a shrine, you think, at first. But I found that it was actually a, a ruined town with city walls. Um, it's probably not very clear from the image, but the, the massive city walls still there. And there are pottery from Greek and Roman China, and it's, it's a center. But the significance of this place is, before Islam, it was a major pre-Islamic site where rituals took place. And being educated in the West, and my pers the perspective then being focused on monuments and objects, I was exposed to a different perspective on heritage um, that I got locally, which was more about the landscape and the fact that trees could be an archaeological site because they were sacred trees, they were important trees, mountains, and a whole existence was woven around the landscape. The chiefs would be coronated using the sacred mountain, they would be washed on the uh, sacred spring, and the trees, uh, the, the leaves from the sacred trees would be, they would be showered with those leaves because they would be giving fertility to, to their people. So uh, it's a way of um, consecrating the, the, the people and also using uh, ancestral shrines to, for uh, rainmaking, um, human and animal crop fertility. And it was a whole new uh, thing for me. I, I really didn't know anything about this. And within Islam, it's not something that people have uh, talked about, or uh, it's just things that, in, in a very seemingly insignificant way, the way I've inherited the worker, exists, and women usually keep these traditions. And anthropologists usually who've come to our country focus, they're usually male, white, and they've all um, focused uh, into nomadism, um, poetry, and male culture. But this link in the dealings with the human, the birth and death, all of these rituals that are perennial and continue, was something that seemed in, uh, unreachable to them somehow, uh, because they were not associated with a major object or with, with a major monument. And uh, this site became, after uh, Islam, uh, it became a major center for, for Islamic religion, and it was in, appropriated by the earliest Islamic uh, kingdoms in the region. And here we found um, Chinese pottery from Ming Dynasty, which is 15th century, and even earlier, 13th century um, uh, pottery, 
and it shows the wealth of this region. However, our people do not link archaeology to their heritage because I met people who said, oh, these sites, they belong to the people who were big boned and they, they are not uh, even Somalis. It's Qurumi uh, Hore, which means um, ancient people that don't look like us, that are not us. And hence, a lot of people were looting the archaeological sites because they had detached themselves from the, this link with the heritage. Also, the colonial times, uh, the narrative did not help because a lot of the sites that were discovered were attributed to other people. Uh, although there were, we found ruined sites, uh, ruined towns all over the country, people just said, oh, it's Arabs who have outposts in the coast. And people uh, felt that the archaeology wasn't really something that was linked to their past. They, they, uh, it was something that was introduced or uh, other people have come with. And people started looting after the war. Warlords used it to fund their war. They um, commissioned illicit digging. And I was interested in understanding this phenomenon and nobody reported it um, uh, of Somali heritage being looted. So I went to Somali women and uh, took with me a catalog of object, uh, with images of objects and said, uh, this has happened, we've lost so many artifacts, what do you think? And that's when I realized actually people don't, are indifferent to archaeology because we have an indigenous way of managing cultural heritage in our society, regardless of monuments and uh, artifacts. And this is um, what I call the knowledge approach. People were able to look at the same document and tell me how to make the objects, what they are made from, uh, who makes them. So it's not that they, they have no knowledge of their history, they do, but it's just that we preserve it in an intangible way. It's an oral culture. People value the knowledge rather than the possession of an object. So I thought, why are women in the diaspora uh, valuing this, uh, sort of uh, keeping this knowledge alive when surely household products uh, that uh, you don't need to use in Europe, you just go to Argos and you buy yourself a mat or a rug. But they were keeping this heritage and it's because we come from the nomadic landscapes. Here, what's important is not how, how many objects you keep, but in fact, um, what you can make from scratch when you need it. We carry very little with us. Everything you own is on that camel. And also everything is organic. So that house can burn in one hour and you're in that landscape. So what do you do? You need to know exactly which tree to go to to get the roots for your hut. You need to know exactly which tree to go to in order to hear uh, a wound, medicinal knowledge. So our heritage was something that's kept in our head and basically passed on to our children. And the women in the diaspora that I interviewed were talking about their mem those memories and those experiences. And that's what they treasured, not the lost museum objects that they hadn't seen or known about that have been looted. For them, they did not lose anything. As long as they had this knowledge and they could um, pass it on, that was their heritage. So it was a very interesting context where you have also these desperate people who are looting the archaeology, but then at, at the same time, they have this complex, locally appropriate theoretical framework to cultural heritage management. Uh, so, as an archaeologist, I, I was very fascinated by this, and uh, I enjoyed learning it. But I also wanted it to be part of the um, um, mainstream archaeology, so that these ideas are brought in to, uh, to enrich archaeology uh, and empower archaeology. The same way that I could empower the community by bringing in my knowledge. So um, we did many training courses and, and uh, recently I set up this organization, Horn Heritage. 
and we have we, we are doing various projects to uh, work with the community directly. Um, community are very, very proud of these sites. Initially, they didn't know what they were, but I used to use sites from Scandinavia. From, I used to have a, an album to explain to them how similar sites are managed elsewhere. I even had a, um, uh, an album with Stonehenge uh, explaining how, you know, what, what people benefit from heritage. So people uh, increasingly could see the, even the financial potential of it. And we were actually able to manage sites like Class Girl. So it's in, in, there are communities who are living of it. Um, and what I wanted to introduce was for them to be able to use technology. And uh, at the moment, uh, Somaliland, we have the, the, a, a young generation who are very used to IT. So we incorporated them into the organization and we liaised with um, a, a, a very good organization who has worked in all over the world digitalizing world heritage sites. Um, it was a challenge at first to find funding, but the Swiss government funded this project. So we were able to um, take people to, uh, to the site and train them. Here's also people from the Ministry of uh, Tourism getting training in 3D digitalization. And this is the second time uh, this is technology is being used for sites in Africa, and we are very happy that it's actually Somaliland, uh, where usually you wouldn't associate uh, such development with. I'm going to show you um, some of the results. Um, in Somaliland, you have very speedy internet. We realized this because we could um, do the digitization. Actually, I, I got injured on my way to this project, so I wasn't there, but I was in Kenya. And we were able to send the material off to SIARC's headquarters in uh, Oakland, California. And then within the next day, we were able to receive the processed material. So uh, this is Lascale, a 5,000-year-old site with rock art. And this is, I call it, the Sistine Chapel of Somaliland. And here's why we've got a fly-through image I started uh, this talk by an anecdote saying something about my secondary school and the fact that I li lacked uh, history classes in Africa. And my, um, one of my goals have been to use everything I've said so far and everything that we've discovered to feed that into the um, into the curriculum. And this is exactly what we are doing now. We, uh, we've held many workshops with the Ministry of Education and various um, schools, in the heads of the secondary schools in Somaliland. And I'm hoping this, the next generation of Somalis will not face the problem I faced and will be able to just open their history book and learn their heritage. Thank you.